to the fourth and final final day of the Simons workshop on to the fourth and final day of the Simons workshop on quantum protocols. So in the past two days, we've um, heard a lot about how non-local games and multi-prover interactive proofs can test really powerful quantum systems, in particular um, provers with unbounded number of qubits. And we also saw how those protocols have really important and significant consequences for questions in complexity theory and mathematics. So today uh, we come back to much more immediate concerns and we're gonna focus on how to verify and test real world quantum computers. So we'll hear about protocols for cross-checking quantum platforms against each other and how to benchmark quantum systems. And we'll also learn about different noise models for quantum systems as well. So um, let me remind you all that you are very much encouraged to ask questions throughout the talk. You can do that by typing in a question to the question and answer box, or you cl can click on the raise your hand question and I can unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. So please do participate throughout. Um, so our first talk of the day will be given by Andreas Elben from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And he's gonna tell us about cross uh, platform verification. So Andreas. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction and the invitation here to speak here. And yeah, I would like to thank the organizers uh, in particular very much for, for putting this great workshop together despite this very um, difficult circumstances at the moment. So I'm very happy to talk today about some recent work which we did in Innsbruck on um, something which we called cross platform verification of intermediate scale quantum devices uh, with a technique which we dubbed uh, randomized measurements. So, um, as was, as was already said, I will speak here about throughout this talk uh, about very concrete protocols on, on to physically test and, and verify, in this sense, um, intermediate scale quantum devices, so NISC devices. And these protocols will be, in a certain sense, directly tuned to the particular strengths and weaknesses of these um, current state of the art uh, quantum devices. In particular, I will speak about uh, um, a verification protocol in the sense of a comparative verification or a cross-checking of quantum devices um, by means of compar com uh, comparing two or multiple of them, um, um, the outcome of, of quantum simulations or quantum compu computations performed on them. And this comparison should, should be done on the full quantum level. And this, uh, to achieve this, we use a technique which we, we, we call randomized measurements here. That's something we have been developing uh, in Innsbruck over the past years uh, uh, quite intensively. And here were a bunch of, a lot of people involved, in particular my supervisor, Peter Zoller, uh, a former postdoc in my group, NOR, and also Rick and Christian. And I will show um, throughout my talk uh, quite some experimental results which have been obtained in a very nice collaboration we have at Ikoki in Innsbruck. Um, with a local iron trapping group, which is led by uh, Rainer Blatt and, and Christian Rose. So as I've said, I, I will be speaking about um, verification of directly intermediate scale devices. So I would like to start with just flashing one slide on what kind of devices I have actually in mind here. And here I'm, here I'm pretty broad. So I'm, I'm, I'm considering all sorts of um, NISC, NISC devices, which are in today's lab laboratories, for example, ultra cold atoms, good plug atoms, uh, which can be trapped in, in, um, in optical lattices or optical tweezers. And you could can do very nice quantum simulation experiments with them, or also some um, building blocks of quantum computation um, uh, have, have been demonstrated in particular with good plug atoms. Then we are of course also trapped ions, which can serve as full-fetched uh, quantum, quantum computers but can you also use them to perform quantum simulations of, of spin models? And same holds basically true for superconducting qubits and many more of these um, platforms which are currently emerging and, and developed more and more. Common to all of these NISC devices is I think a, a great toolbox which, have, which experimentalists have been developing in the course of the last years, which includes um, a single side or single particle resolved quantum control and measurement in these devices. And so given this toolbox and the fact that we, all of these systems become bigger and bigger and thus more and more complex, there's also there's the intermediate question 
uh, about how to verify uh, such devices. So to, to test whether they, they perform as, as you would like and they, um, that their, their fun functionality is essentially correct. And then also to probe um, the interesting um, quantum states which you can um, um, prepare in them. And so in, in my talk, I, I would like to, to propose or present you one, one kind of possible protocol to, to answer such question and how, uh, how you approach these kind of things in, in basically all of this um, in um, quantum systems here. And so to start with, uh, I would like to, 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 to show you or to, to remind you just uh, in briefly in one slide on, on a kind of theory sketch on how quantum experiments are actually done today. And later on, I will, will um, just generalize this then to, to a specific more protocol, to, to, to specific protocols. So and a, a typical quantum experiment uh, is, is done in the following way. You start with a very simple classical initial state, which can be easily prepared, typically a product state let's say this four ions here, which are prepared in some spin up state. And then um, actually the interesting part starts to happen. So you perform a quantum simulation or quantum computation. Uh, and when this is done, there has been hopefully an interesting many body quantum state has been prepared. And you would like to go out and learn something about this quantum state now. And the way this is typically done is when one just performs a projective measurement of of, for example, a local spin configuration in the system. Of course, from, from a single such a projective measurements, you don't learn much due to the inherent probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. But what you what's typically then done is, is just the, the measurement is repeated a lot of times to learn quantum expectation values. For example, here, just the probability to see such specific spin configuration. And from this quantum expectation values, you can then learn in turn learn something about the quantum state which you have prepared in first place. So that's kind of a basic scheme where most experiments are done today. And it's of course very successful and, and, and applied in a day-to-day -day basis. What I would like to do now in this talk is uh, to generalize in a, in, a, this in, in, in a specific way. And I think if you have listened uh, to, the, to the great talk by Richard Kung and on Monday in this workshop, you will or really be a bit familiar with what, what's, what's coming next. So the, the entire sequence, so the first building block of the sequence stays the same, the, the quantum state is prepared, but then prior to the projective measurement, um, we inject a controlled random unitary, a controlled random operation onto the system and then perform the projective measurement. And then you get some outcome and typically what you could now do is starting to repeat this again a lot of times and you will find again a quantum expectation value but this quantum expectation value does not know not only depend on the state psi which you have prepared but also on the random unitary which you have applied here so it's itself this quantum expectation value is now itself uh, uh, probabilistic it's a random it's a single instance of a random variable and this single instance doesn't tell you much it's just a random number However, it becomes interesting if you start studying the distribution of such quantum expectation values over many random unitaries. And what we have learned in, in the past years is that these kind of distributions of, of such expectation values contain really a lot of uh, interesting physics. So for example, if you just go and, and look at second order here, so you just multiply two of these expectation values probabilities together and take an average over many random unitaries, we have been found that basically quantities of this type and um, contain a lot of interesting physics. So you can use them to probe uh, any entropies and entanglement of the quantum state you have been preparing here. You can use if you perform such kind of protocols on two um, independent devices, you can, you can use this to, to measure many body fidelities and this then in turn to use uh, to do such kind of cross platform verification. This will be the main talk of my talk today here. But then uh, you can also use uh, this type of statistics, this type of protocols to access more quantum simulation inspired um, quantities. For example, one can measure out of time ordered correlation functions and also use this type of statistics even to, to fully characterize um, um, many body topological invariants uh, in, in symmetry protected topological phases. So you can really, uh, this kind of statistics can serve as a complete can, can completely classify one-dimensional SPT phases. 
so it's a it's a quite powerful uh, toolbox and a quite quite nice tool and in, especially in this workshop and not the only one over talking about this kind of or similar um, settings so we had, had already on on monday uh, a talk by, by uh, richard king who introduced this notion of classical shadows which is uh, uh, which he even showed that this is an, in, can be served as an optimal way to to um, estimate expectation values of observables and just in the next talk after me i think we will we'll hear some uh, we will have a talk by joseph emerson on on randomized and cyclic benchmarking um, has also used such kind of random op random unitary operations to extract um, noise properties of in, 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 in quantum uh, of quantum operations. But now today in in, in my talk, I, I will focus on, on these three aspects. I will first introduce these randomized measurements in a bit more um, direct, uh, bit more deeper way uh, in on on the example of the second rainy entropy. Then I will come to this the main topic of this talk, uh, which is this cross verification, cross platform verification, and in the end, if if time permits, I will show you also some some results uh, which have been recently obtained. Um, first, on a, of a protocol to measure this out of time ordered correlation functions with the same um, with this same toolbox, with randomized measurements, and this this have we have been developing this in particular also with Norman Yao uh, from from Berkeley. And I will show you in, in all of these three blocks, I will basically show us some experimental results um, from the collaboration with uh, Christian Roos and, and Rainer Blatt. Andreas, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so in the previous slide, uh, it looks like for the these correlations, um, you have the choice of like this S1 and S2. So for yeah. these different applications, is it you're just picking different ensembles of unitaries U and also different choices of S1 and S2? Or? Uh, so you, yes, you can pick different ensembles. You can um, pick um, different S1, or typically you can also sum over, over different ones. Uh, I will show in, in the next slide a bit in more detail what, what exactly um, yeah. these S1 and so on are. Yeah. OK, sounds good. OK, um, yeah, exactly. So it will appear here in the course of these purity measurements again, and I'll explain here. So um, I would like to show this this protocol, which is in first um, pretty independent of any um, device where you particular implement it. But I would like to show it here now in, uh, for the purpose of this talk directly in the experimental setting where it has been then realized. So um, what we have in, in the ion trapping group in Innsbruck is that they have such pole traps where they trap linear strings of ions. Um, and then they can do exactly in this in the quantum simulation kind of mode of the experiment, what they can do is then exactly what I've been describing before. Right? So they, they, they start with some simple product state. And then they can do time evolution um, with an interacting many body Hamiltonian that's typically a long range X, Y or easing type model. And then they, they've prepared some many body state Psi. And, and our task or our question was here, how can we characterize now the entanglement that has actually been hopefully built up during this, this time evolution. So how can we characterize um, really the, the intrinsic quantum properties which which happening in, in, in this cause of this time evolution to do the interaction uh, in the semitonium. Uh, and the idea was we, we can use at least, we can at least quantify the bipartite um, entanglement using the, the purities. So purities of individual subsystem and, and then also of the total system and conclude from this uh, of the first of the unitarity of the dynamics and then also of the entanglement. The problem here is, of course, that this purity is not a, a single copy observable. And in such an iron trapping experiment, you have typically only a single copy of your quantum state at hand at one time. So the question is how to measure, and that's precisely where these randomized measurements come in. Um, in, in, the, in the following way. So here, prior, the quantum state is prepared and then you uh, apply a, a set of local random unitaries. In this case, local ones. So in this case, it's just each, each qubit, each spin is individually rotated on its blocks here in a completely random way. So specifically, these, these, these unitaries are picked from, from unitary two designs here. But to, since it's just single qubit, you can also sample directly from the Haar measure. Uh, and then you, after this application of this, this random unitaries, 
um, you perform a measurement in a fixed computational basis, and then um, one measures uh, by repetition with a fixed unitary um, estimates probabilities of seeing such spin configurations. And now this is then repeated uh, in, a, in the second round for many unitaries, and you would like to characterize the statistics of these um, these probabilities. And so the first uh, and most trivial thing is just you, you take an average over these probabilities. And of course, that what you find then if, if the experiment is working correctly in the sense that you, uh, you that you have uh, that we each each spin each uh, each config configuration is now uh, equally likely. So it should be just one divided by the Hilbert space dimension here, the, the average. That's just a first indication that you have indeed prepared a random state. But of course, it's 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 just really a third indication and some, some sort of also trivial. But it becomes more interesting if you now really start at, at second order correlation, start looking at second order correlations. So for example, you, you just take um, these probabilities, multiply two of them together, take an average over many random unitaries, and then you sum them up with some um, um, coefficients in, in front, sum all of them up. And what you find is that this equals in, in, in the average over many random unitaries then directly to the purity here. Um, so second order cross correlations give rise to a second order um, quantity here is reduced and the purity of this reduced density matrix. So typically the experiment is done on the full system, but then via post-processing, you can just uh, restrict to individual subsystems here, whatever, whatever you like, and then you get purities of all possible subsystems in the system. So that's also kind of here, it's, it, uh, it doesn't really matter which, uh, so in the end, it doesn't matter what kind of specific spin configuration you pick here, because you, um, you, you, you take an average over many random unitaries. So you, you, you render or you, in the end, you get something which is invariant and the local unitary transformations out here. And so it doesn't really pick, but the, the, since we get the information of all, all, um, pro, all probabilities from these measurements, from these local local measurements, as, as David Gross uh, was telling them, we can really sum over all of them here. And that's, that's how it is done here. Uh, just let me now show you in, in one slide how one, one can put just prove such, such relation here. Um, and the first and sort of uh, uh, direct observation is um, that the purity is, of course, it's not an expectation value of a single copy observable, but it's an expectation value of a two copy observable. And the, the observable is this, the, the so-called swap operator. So that's kind of the first thing to see. The second thing is that, of course, if I what I can do is if I have such a product of um, expectation values or probabilities and, and some sum here in front, I can always rewrite this as a big trace over, in some sense, artificially over two virtual what we can call virtual copies of this two of this, this quantum state. And the operator which is appearing in front here is basically given by this two copy operator A, which is just defined by this coefficients here in front, um, twirled with uh, this random unitaries uh, of this in the form of this tensor product here. Uh, and that's uh, probably familiar to many uh, of in the audience. That's, this, that's, a, that's a unitary twirling channel, in this case, evaluated on this two copy space or on this two copy operator. And one can just calculate what comes out here, and there's one uses here also something which we have um, heard on Monday already several times. One can use true while duality to evaluate this channel, and what one finds is that actually the, um, this channel applied to this operator A will be just a linear combination uh, of permutation operators. And one of these perturb perturbation oper permutation operators is, of course, directly the swap operator. And so the goal is. Uh, we would like to find an operator A, which such that this, this whole linear combination here collapses just to the swap operator. And we can find this and, and choose this particular these coefficients, which have been um, shown here in the, the slide before. So what's actually done in, 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 in this, this formula is really that we, we, sample, um, we sample here from, from the, the, the matrix element of the swap operators by this, um, by this unitary transformations. Uh, so this is all what I want, wanted to, to say to the, to the proof. If you um, 
if you look a, a bit, uh, if you look at this a little bit more experimentalist uh, um, point of view, then you will find that the protocol is actually it has its strength is is only it has only local operations and local measurements. So something which and it's only a single copy. So some, it's something which David Gross uh, would call local local uh, measurements and local local operations. And this is in particular to be seen in, in contrast to, to earlier um, previous experiments and protocols that, which were based on the interference of, of two copies. So another way of, of measuring the purity would really be directly preparing two copies um, of your quantum state in, in your lab. And this has been done in, in, in very nice experiments in, in, in optical lattices. And then measure the swap operator by an interference of these two copies. So this is possible, but it's for many experiments, for, for example, also for this ion trapping um, experiment here, it's a difficult task to do because you really need to do, um, you really need to, to prepare two copies um, of your state at the same time in the same lab. So, so this protocol uses only these local operations on a single, um, on a single copy is in this sense a bit easier. However, it comes also as drawback that you typically need to, to, to do a lot of measurements. So you, you look at uh, statistics of these probabilities and you average them over many unitaries. So what one finds if one analyzes the, the, the number of measurements one needs to do, one finds typically an exponential growth here uh, of a necessary number of measurements with the subsystem size what one interested in. So the global system can be very big, but the, the subsystem um, determines the number of measurements you need to do. But sort of importantly is that this exponential is, is if you, at least if you compare it to a full quantum state tomography, it's a very friendly exponential, as you say. So we, we can go up to maybe 10 or 20 qubits, even um, with, with, with this kind of protocols and estimate purities with a reasonable number of measurements and, 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 and unitaries. Um, yeah, I would like to here also connect to this, the talk by, by Richard. Um, he has also shown that with his, his classical shadows, uh, can in a kind of sim, uh, can also access uh, purities, for example, and he was also finding this exponential growth. So I think it's it's pretty something pretty fundamental if you have um, if you don't assume anything about your quantum state here and would like to measure the purity. But to show you uh, that despite this this exponential, we can actually uh, this can actually be done in the experiment um, in a reasonable way. I would like to show you now some some experimental results. Um, of exactly this, this type of experiment. So we have a 10 ion system and we would like to measure purities of individual subsystems. So what's, what's plotted here is a purity, um, the purity as a function of subsystem size. So number one would be just the ion one, two would be ion one and two, three would be ion one, two and three and so on up to 10, which would be the full system. And so what you see here is the purity of the initial state of this experiment. So this is a yield state. It should, should be a pure product state, ideally, right? And you also see that, okay, a single qubit is quite pure, but then um, the measured purity drops a little bit um, up to a, a still for, for 10 ion system, a quite high value of 0.76. Um, and, and in addition, what I understand quite well where this comes from, this drop, it's, it's really decoherence which acts, uh, so it's initial state, prep, it's state preparation and it's decoherence which acts during the application of this single qubit random unit. Okay, so you have here this kind of drop, but if you now, if you now start time evolution, um, what one sees is that the purities of individuals, individual subsystems, small subsystems become quickly very mixed and they drop even further, and, but when the, the purity increases again and, and the total subsystem purity is over time evolution, approximately at least uh, within error bars, um, constant in time. So this means that within error bars, um, one, one performs here really kind of unitary dynamics in the system. And in addition, individual subsystems become quickly very mixed. And if you look at you can also look at this in, a, in the dual picture, of course, just that's just the same data um, shown as a um, shown yeah, the, the, as a negative logarithm, so the second rainy entropy. And what you see here is that you have a lot of entropy in, in the smaller subsystems and you have not so much entropy in the global system. And this clearly shows you that there's entanglement built up in the system and you see this, this 
kind of nice uh, decay of entropy with increasing subsystem size, which is something which can only happen in, in quantum systems. Um, so this is, uh, um, yeah, this shows, demonstrates that there is bipartite entanglement in the system. And you, as I've said already before, uh, with this method, you can even, you can go a little bit further even, and you, you can look at all possible subsystems and not only connected ones like, like plotted here, but also disconnected uh, subsystems. And so in total, there are two to be 10 subsystems in this 10 ion system. And so what you have is, um, What's plotted here is this, this two to the 10 um, subsystem as a function of, of its size. Um, and you see that all possible subsystems actually have a higher entropy um, than the global system here. So what this tells you is that all bipartitions um, in this in this systems are, are really entangled. Uh, exactly. So what's it, uh, um, this is all what I, I wanted to say to this, this purity estimation. And now I would like to come um, to the second part, but before I would like, to, yeah, if there, ask if there are some questions at the moment. Could you go back to the, the graph? Um, yes. I, I, I didn't fully understand what's the difference between the horizontal uh, axis and the vertical axis. Say the left, uh, the left, uh, yeah. So that's the purity of an, a subsystem. So it, it can be between one and zero mm -hmm. of, of a density matrix. And what's plotted here is the number of qubits like, uh, of, this, of, uh, of the subsystem of which the density. So the, these are purities of reduced um, density matrices of certain subsystems. And the number of qubits in, in the subsystems is plotted here. So mm -hmm. one would be just the i and one. The reduced density, the purity of a reduced density matrix of i and one, and then you have i and one and two and so on up to i and ten would be the, the density, the purity of the density matrix of the entire system. Mm -hmm. exactly the purple, that. the purple line is for all ten from the get -go. purple line. Purple line is this would be i and one, two, and this would be i and one and two, and this would be the full full ten ion system. At a time which is t equal zero, so this is this quench dynamics experiment. What what's done here is you, you start with a simple initial state, and this is the purities of this initial state of various subsystems. And oh, then um, the different colors are different uh, time of the quench dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, uh, uh, at the beginning, what you expect is that you have a, a pure product state. But of course, in experiment, it's not quite pure. You, what, what you see is that a, a single ion uh, is it's not entangled with all the others, so its purity is, is one. If you reduce, you look at the reduced subsystem of or, or a reduced density matrix of one ion, you, you, you see just it's approximately one, so you, um, it's a pure state. And then it's, but it's not quite one. It's a 0.99, and then you, you go to 0.99 to the power of 10 approximately. It, not quite a number, but something like this, you see that, that, that um, you, you find here a drop mm -hmm. and that up to the full system. I see, so the, color, then, the, the colored lines correspond to some, some computation or some dynamics. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the, in, in this experiment, um, what's done here is, is they prepare a, a simple initial state and then they do time evolution with this interacting many body Hamiltonian. And, and what's plotted here is, is exactly um, the time uh, is, is, is after certain times you stop time evolution and look at the, the purity, um, the purity of the distribution of various subsystems. And so this would be I, this would be the um, at initial time. So there is no time evolution. So there's just a, a supposedly pure product state. It's not quite pure, but we understand also why. And then you start increasing time evolution. So we, we, we let time evolution or they let time evolution in the lab, they let it run from one, one millisecond. Um, and then again, we stop and look at the purities of various subsystems. I and see. your and so, horizontal axis I is the size of A, the set? Exactly. It's okay. like here, you have I equals one, I okay. equals two would be, yeah. would be two ions and so on. Yes, exactly. And then it's precisely like this. You you see that over in the course of the time evolution, so the longer the time evolution goes, 
we find that individual subsystems are more and more mixed, smaller ones, whereas the total system purity is basically constant in over this a, uh, entire time evolution. Here. Okay, and we also have a question here from Juan. Yes, thanks. So, uh, and the expression for the uh, purity, so you have two averages, right? Like, so one would be over S and SA, and then another one over U. So, like, in when you do it in experiment, do you uh, go uh, more on uh, averaging over different S, or do you have to do a lot of uh, different U's and so on? So, which yeah. one uh, dominates kind of like the error? Um, so basically, the, the S is not uh, it's not a problem because the, what what's done in in the experiment is um, they they measure each on in, on each qubit they measure in the computational basis, and if you just now record you get you get one shot you get one configuration out, mm -hmm. and then you repeat this a lot of times for a fixed otherwise sequence, and you get just by counting statistics you get just the probability of all possible S. For all possible basis states. Oh, so you system, do all of them. You get probabilities of all of them exactly by just repeating this fixed sequence with a fixed set of unitaries here. A lot of times you get uh, counting uh, just by counting. You get statistics, uh, or you, you can estimate the probability of of seeing a specific configuration. Uh, and that's typically that's one thing which is done. That's one loop, and then the second loop is your average over many unitaries. And then you, you average all of this. And, but as you said, there's a lot of averaging going on. So for example, in, in practice, um, what one does is this, this sequence to estimate these this probabilities is just repeated of the order of 100 times in a Hilbert space of 1,000. So we, we a lot of times don't see a, a single spin configuration at all. Um, but um, so the, the estimation of these probabilities is, is very bad in a sense, but then the average over, we, we, we count over all of them and then the average over many random unitaries here. And in this way, you get in the end uh, a good uh, approximation of this purity. Okay, thanks. Okay, then uh, I'm, I'm gonna move on and, and come to the second part. And here uh, I'm facing now, uh, I'm facing the, the following situation. So, um, we have two quantum machines, suppose we have two of them, uh, and they prepare some quantum many-body state psi. Um, and you would like, what you would like to do is to verify that they have both prepared the same state. So imagine this could be the outcome of some quantum simulation or quantum computation. We would just want to know whether they've, both of them have done the same. And this can be in a very broad sense, like it can be super, it can be quantum computing, quantum simulation platforms, also different, different ones. Uh, in particular, different ones, and you would like just to test whether they perform in a consistent way. And of course, if if they, these machines operate in a way where they can, uh, they they can look at, at also at theory, or we can we can do a classical simulation of a, the computation of a simulation. Um, we would also like to compare with a known um, theory state, which uh, and, and know whether this quantum state on on my classical machine they say matches to the the, the quantum machine. Uh, for the second part, there, there exists already protocols at quantum time, um, which have been developed by Steve, uh, which I think we'll be talking just later. Um, so in, in this talk, I will concentrate more on this side that we have at the moment, where we have upper no knowledge about this quantum state uh, prepared in these machines. And we just would like to check whether they're the same. So they have, they are, can, can be unknown, but we would like to know that they're the same. Uh, and what, what does it mean to be the same? So we would like to, to um, measure um, the fidelity between these two quantum states prepared here. Uh, for pure states, which would be just fidelity would be just the overlap of the two quantum states um, squared. Um, but typically in experiment, of course, we don't have pure states. Uh, what we would like to look at is, for example, we have a globally mixed states of the entire system, or we could also just start looking and comparing subsystems of, of entangled states. So it can be subsystems of very large, la very large quantum devices. And we just look and compare um, certain subsystems here. And then of course we need mixed states fidelities and there's, um, there's not, then there's not a unique uh, fidelity anymore. There are a couple of one, the, the, the most canonical is maybe the, um, the, the Ullmann uh, fidelity, which is however, 
due to its a complicated, like its square root structure, it's complicated to access, I think, numerically and, and, and even more for experiments. So somewhat simpler quantities, which are also fidelities, are, are the so-called Hilbert-Schmidt fidelities, which, um, which are, uh, which are of the following structure. So one of them is just here. You just what, what you do is you, you you have here a trace product of two of the two uh, density matrices, and that's itself it's not a fidelity because even if we, these two density matrices are exactly the same, if you if they are mixed, then of course this trace product is not one. But what you can do is you can renormalize um, this um, by the maximum, for example, by the maximum of these two purities, and then one finds that this 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 whole expression is indeed a fidelity. It fulfills certain actions, and it can also be, be there is at least conjectured that there is an, 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 a relation to the to the Ullmann fidelity, uh, at least on average over many quantum states. So this is kind of the type of quantity I'm, I'm looking at, and we uh, we're asking the questions: How can we measure this in, in quantum antibody systems? And yes. of course, there were yes. Just a quick. This is Robin Blumkehout. Very quick question. Um, why are these the questions that you want to answer? Um, why do you want to yeah. verify that the two machines have prepared the same state? Why is the fidelity the right metric? And why are the subsystem fidelities interesting? It seems like that's sort of foundational and you know, we, we could phrase the questions in many different ways. Yes, exactly. Uh, so what our intention was here, um, so is, uh, yeah, it's it's really basically motivated from an experimental setting. We have two qu quantum machines where we where we don't really we, we might even be not accessible anymore by direct um, classical computation, and you would like to check um, whether they, they they perform in a consistent way. And then our idea was just uh, can we check whether they have prepared a set? They, they run some computation or some simulations. Um, can be based on a very different physical architecture, but when we would like to check whether we have done this in the same way, have we come to the same outcome? And, and how we imagine this here is, is uh, just looking at the overlap of, just looking at the quantum state we've been preparing and, and check whether they have been the same. And in this way, at least um, gain trust of, of the two devices and maybe you, you have more, uh, confidence in one of those devices because you have tested it a lot and then you just cross-check your second machine which you have also a hand on newly building and you just cross-check uh, does it prepare does it prepare the, the same quantum state in the full level and and to do this we, we imagine that the fidelity is a, is a good measure because it just tells you yeah it, it is the same quantum state and to what degree it is the same quantum state it is one or it decays from one um, does this answer your question or uh, reasonably, I was just curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I can I, this is Joe Emerson. I have a quick Hi. question. So if, if both devices are so yes. noisy, they produce the identity state, which yes. is unfortunately very experimentally realistic, um, then would your Fidel F max quantity, I guess you call it F max in the paper, would that say yep. you pass the test, you both, you get a fidelity of one? Yes, uh, if, yeah, if you're both completely wrong, then we, we get one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but you would, of course, um, we, we, uh, we will always as a byproduct, for example, see the purities of these individual devices. And if, so we gain a little bit more information than just saying one, we, we also see that there's no purity and we would then be, of course, concluding that's probably both machines are wrong, I guess we would, yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, just uh, maybe uh, one cartoon slide and how, how we can could measure this thing. Of course, we could ex establish a quantum link between these two quantum machines and just um, try to teleport one state to the other uh, and, and look at it and, and, and pe perform this measurement locally. And this local uh, overlap measurements of two quantum states to many body quantum states have been demonstrated as I've been already saying before. However, problem at this kind of version on how, how could one measure this is of course that this kind of quantum link at least for many body, many body systems does not or many body quantum state does not really exist. And so option two on, on the, the other side, uh, other end of the possibilities would basically be of course just perform tomography on both devices, communicate the results um, and, and just compute the fidelity. 
But that's of course exponentially inefficient and maybe also not the most uh, clever or optimal solution. And so we, we're kind of thinking, how can we do this um, without quantum link, but a bit more efficient, at, at least somewhat more efficient than, than photomography. Um, and the idea is to use exactly again these randomized measurements in the, in the in a very similar way as been describing before. So uh, you 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 do a quantum state, you prepare the quantum state, you you apply a set of random unitaries to it, and then measure it. And what what one gets out is, of course, from the statistics of of these probabilities, we get out the purity. And we can do in platform two, of course, the same thing. We get also the purity. Um, and now, if if you now really use this if one can uses now the same random unitaries in both devices, then of course you can also cross correlate the, the, pro, the two probabilities. And what you find is exactly by a very simple generalization of the formula I've been presenting before, that just the cross correlation of the covariance of these probabilities um, matches to the, the trace product of these two states. Um, Exactly. So in this way, you have all the ingredients you need for this Hilbert-Schmidt fidelities, and importantly, it involves only classic communications of, of such kind of local local measurements in both devices. So it's really, just local operations, local local spin measurements, and with a crucial um, kind of assumption or ingredient which you need to um, guarantee that you have prepared the same random unitaries on both devices. Um, of course, the crucial question is again, how many do we need now in the end of this? Um, um, measurements and where we have two parameters at hand we have first of all this first loop to estimate this probability so we have number of measurements per unitary and then we have a second one we have we don't like to estimate this ensemble average so we have a number of a bunch of random unitaries and this the multiple the product of these two um, will give you the, the total number of measurements and so what's plotted here is the total number of measurements um, as a function of the total number of measurements to obtain this F max, this fidelity of max, uh, which I've been defining before, up to a up to a fixed statistical error um, as a function, of, and that's plotted here. This number of measurements you need to do it to get it up to a fixed statistical error up to a subsystem size, up to uh, and as a function of the subsystem size. And what you can see here is, of course, that's a logarithmic scales uh, again. That this is kind of an exponential growth here. For example, if you focus here on the product state. Um, um, you, you find it, you find an exponential, but if you look at these exponents, which which come out here from this numerical calculations, um, and that you, you in, that you actually find that these exponents are below one. So they are again, if you at least if you compare to full quantum state tomography, they're quite quite friendly. Um, so uh, it's again this kind of regime of ten to twenty uh, ten to twenty qubits where this kind of method would be applicable, and it's important again that here's just the subsystem size is appearing. So you could um, uh, you could in in this kind of regime these these, these methods are applicable, and again that's kind of exactly this regime where this where uh, today for example this ex experiment in in this book was was done, and um, so I will show you here, that's again some experimental results we have at the moment not two quantum quantum machines which we which you can compare uh, at present but um, what we have is an experiment um, it's exactly what this experiment i've been describing before so it's this quench dynamics experiments um, start with a small, simple initial state perform a dynamics with an interacting um, hamiltonian and get some um, experimental state out and now we can of course go and and also simulate this experiment uh, on the theory and and perform and apply on the on on to the theoretical state the same random unitaries and then also and, and estimate or calculate these probabilities exactly just on a theory computer and then when we can cross correlate theory and experiment in precisely the form I've been describing before and the result what comes out there is plotted here so what's what's shown here is this fidelity. As again, as a fun for various subsystems, so again, as a function of the subsystem size. So one would be just one ion, two would be one and two ion, 10 would be uh, the full 10 ion system um, fidelity. So redu of reduced density matrix, or in this case, the full density matrix for 10 ions uh, in this setting. So what you can see here is that individual um, subsystems, small subsystems match very well to with, between theory and experiment. When, but if you then increase, then of course you see a slight drop. Uh, um, uh, you see a, a drop um, up to the 
full 10 iron assist fidelity. And also you see a drop if you increase this time up after which the, the, the fidelity is measured with the inferior experiment. So the, the different colors are getting different times. But still, uh, for, 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 for full 10 iron system, you see that there's an, compared to the minimal value, which would be one divided by Hilbert space dimension here, you find really quite a high fidelity still up here, despite this, this state, as I've been showing before, really a complex state with a lot of entanglement. In it. And so I this guess, kind of shows, yes? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just actually, just wanted to follow up on something that Robin asked. So uh, it seems like for this, uh, you know, validation with theory, you, it seems like the yep. thing you most care about is the, the overlap of the entire 10 qubits with what's predicted by theory. It, yes. And yes. is there a reason to look at fidelities of subsystems? Is that interesting for an intrinsic reason? Uh, yeah, I think it tells you, for example, it tells you something, um, I will, we'll come to it in also in the next, it tells you a little bit how, how, how errors um, increase if you if you look at more System. So if you have if you have a simple state and you see here that decays, you, you will know something about, um, for example, how how large uh, are errors on a, on, a, on a single qubit level, for example. And you, you just extrapolate back, and you 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 can see see cert, uh, some certain quali um, the quality of certain operations um, uh, just by by extrapolating back, for example, and looking how they decay with system size. And um, so I think in this sense, is a, is, it's, an, uh, it's meaningful to look at, at subsystem. And then, of course, I've been showing now before that this is a more general and I think a bit, a bit open question also for me is, well, how much can you learn actually if you just, if you, if you would have in a larger quantum system, you may, might have only access to subsystem fidelities. How much can you learn now about the global fidelities from just looking at, for example, of all possible subsystems in the system um, of all possible subsystems uh, in the system, not necessarily a collect one, but up to a given size only. I think one that's clear some non-trivial information in there, but it, it's a question. It's a yeah, but an open question of how, how much one can learn in, in detail from this. But certainly in, in 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 situations where you understand something about what you have been done, this kind of decay tells you how how good your operations are in in, in a sense. I see. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the, this, can, this is exactly one point um, I wanted to speak now also about it. Um, these are possible imperfections which could, could spoil uh, this this, this um, co comparison with this method. And <clears throat> um, there's one, one, one of them is, of course, I've been saying you need to do the same random unit test on both machines. So what could happen is you, you cannot do this or you cannot, yeah, you just have a mismatch, miscalibration between the experiment or the experiments and the theory. So we'd have some unitary error. And if you have such kind of unitary error, we, we looked at the, um, what, what happens is that this affects the, this, the estimation of this um, nominator. And, and typically what, what, what happens is that this nominator is actually decreased by, by such kind of systematic mass match. And uh, um, I think that's, that's one of the main reasons that you see this drop or, already here uh, in this earlier thing. We, 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 have a, we have a mismatch between the, the, the unitaries which we apply in experiment and the ones we apply in, on a theory computer. And the, how large this mismatch is here, we can actually tell from, from how it decays with system size. And, and the second thing is what, what can happen is, of course, decoherence acting during this random unitaries, and we can on, and there's a finite detection fidelity. And, and all of this can be modeled again as, as decoherence, and this affects now both uh, overlap estimation and purity. Um, but in total, what, what it leads to is that this fidelity is typically also decreased um, by this type of errors. So if you have such kind of possible imperfection, at least in, 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 in perturbation theory, one can show that this leads only to a drop of the estimated fidelity or not false positives. And we also try to characterize this experimentally by um, just preparing uh, an initial product state in a system and we look at it as a theory experiment fidelity. And we, we estimate this fidelity in two ways. So in the first way, we just apply a single random unitary per ion, just the standard way. In the second way, we artificially, or what we did in the experiment was done that we, we um, apply artificially two concatenated random unitaries. So it's still a random unitary, but it's just two of them. And what you can see here then is, for example, that 
that's again, that's a theory experiment fidelity as a function of systems and nice that is actually the concatenant one decays much faster than the, than the um, the one with just a single one. And this just tells you that, of course, these unitary errors and also the decoherence, they add up if you just do double amount of unitaries and that's why it decays here faster. And from this, uh, how, how much the difference here is, you can actually uh, see and how, uh, tell something about the quality of these single qubit operations and how they decay. And Andreas, um, I have yeah. a question. Um, is there error also in the application of the random unitaries and the measurement? Yes, exactly. That's that's um, yeah, that's, that's what you're yeah, yeah, precisely. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, we want to wrap up in a few minutes, so there's time for yeah. questions at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I come to my um, yeah almost last slide on this topic. So you can also see the. The last thing which we tried when the experiment, we don't have two experiments, but what you can do is of course, take the same experiment and correlate with itself. And that's exactly what's plotted here. So um, we, we divide the experimental data in two, two parts, one taking a day one, second at day two, and we correlate the experiment with itself and look at the fidelity of the experiment with itself. And that's exactly what's plotted here. Uh, at initial time, so no time evolution in this quench dynamics, just initial time, and you see the, the, the orange line is um, the fidelity of the experiment to itself, again, as a function of subsystem size. Uh, and what you can see, okay, it, the experiment matches actually quite good to itself. And in particular, it matches much better than, than it would match to, to, to theory. And so this is theory experiment um, of the same state. And that's precisely this mismatch between theory and experiment you have here, which, which, can, which can lead to fidelity decay in the random unitaries. Which doesn't mean that the, the actual state do not match, but it's just the measurement procedure and can't tell you because there's a decorrelation between the, the unitaries. So it tells you that you, that you should, yeah, one, one should really have good uh, single qubit operations here. And the same hold basically too, also for at a later time, um, at one uh, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, and you can you can actually play this game a little bit further and, and not only look at, at at quantum states which are the same, but you can also look at at quantum states which are not supposed to be the same, and 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 starts studying many body quantum dynamics in, 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 this, in the systems. For example, you can look at fidelities of quantum states which are evolved to different times and look at fidelities decay with different time evolution and so on. But that's maybe a topic uh, if it's said and I don't want to go into uh, too much detail here anymore. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say- Okay, a there's a words. question in the uh, question yes? and answer uh, question box. Um, Richard, I could actually, unmute you and you can ask it. Richard, do you want to ask? Uh, yeah, but we can wait to the end of the talk. Okay. Uh, I was anticipating the question session already. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. okay. Um, yeah, so um, maybe maybe that's just one in, in one slide explain um, what, we, what we had in mind for the old talks. Um, so, uh, um, the, 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 the measurement of OTOX um, is, is, um, <clears throat> is the following task. You, you would like to measure a correlation function um, in an experiment, which is of the following type. You have an operator V and you, you have an operator W of T at a light time in an Heisenberg type picture. And then you have an operator V at, a, at some time and an operator W of T at another time. And you would like to measure this, this type of correlation functions um, by uh, and that's typically a very hard correlation function between you have such kind of operators at different times. Which, and you typically what you would need to do in an experiment, you would need to evolve the experiment forward and backward in time, and that's a, a difficult task to do. And so what we thought of is this, this, yeah, this particular type of correlation functions, and you can actually go and measure this type of correlation function again with these randomized measurements um, by just applying random unitaries in two experiments evolve and, and, and just evolve. So what you do is in one experiment, you apply random unitary to initial state, you evolve forward in time and to measure uh, this operator W at a certain time. So get a certain correlation function. And in, in the second experiment, you again um, do this, but you, in addition, you apply this operator V and you just evolve forward in time this experiment. And then you cross correlate with two experiments 
And what you what you find from these cross correlations again is this very non-trivial correlation function that you have here, which involves this uh, operators at different times. And that's kind of the, the, the general idea of this this randomized measurements, which can be applied in very different uh, settings. And that's I think um, I'm already at the end of my time, so I will I will skip. Um, and more details, but if you're interested in here, we have just recently been um, looking at uh, at this type of correlation functions also in experiment and, and found how how um, the OTOC actually behaves in this with strapped ion experiments where we have this non-trivial dynamics of this long-range easing type dynamics. So with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and um, I would just have to wrap up and saying that these randomized measurements are really nice tool to probe and verify quantum states beyond uh, standard observables. And they're very, in, in this way, I've been presenting them really nicely applicable in, in all kind of state of the art quantum simulators, with, where you have such single side um, con control and readout. And importantly, what I've not been talking so much um, about is that all of these local random unitary operations, you can also replace by, replace by multi qubit um, random unitaries. Um, from which you can generate by, by by Clifford gates, for example. So if you're just interested in a two design, or you can also do it by a time evolution in quantum simulation experiments. Um, this gives you sometimes uh, advantages in statistics, but it does cause of higher um, experimental um, complexity. Yeah, and with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I would like to thank you very much for your uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Um, so uh, I will unmute, oops, unmute Richard. Uh, do you want to ask your question, Richard? Yeah. Uh, hi, Andreas. Uh, very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have a practical question. Like on one slide, you said that you had a certain budget on allocating samples across different unitary bases and like per sample repetitions. I yep. think it was like you, you you mentioned that you did 500 random unitaries and 150 samples per random unitary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit about why this is a good choice? Like, um, how do you know how to budget your resources? We basically uh, did this um, uh, by, by grid search. We, we just looked at where we get the best, um, the, the smallest um, statistical error. There's kind of a, a rule of thumb is that you, um, what you if your state is very mixed or very entangled, you, you expect that when it's when it's often sufficient to use less random unitaries, because the fluctuations over over unitaries are just smaller if your state is mixed. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in general, it's 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 really an optimization question. We don't have an, a precise analytic understanding how to choose the best. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Any other questions? Um, Andreas, I have a quick question. This is Robin again. Um, thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, to, I'd like to try and get a sort of you know, physicist back of the envelope idea of resource cost here. And I'm yep. curious if you've thought about the following question. Suppose that um, for your cross-platform verification, um, mm -hmm. imagine that Google had two of their Sycamore devices with you know, 53, yeah. and both yeah. of them are broken in the same way. So they both have 53 qubits, not 54. And okay. yeah. they wanted to demonstrate using your protocol, the same thing that they demonstrated in their nature paper last mm -hmm. year, which mm -hmm. is that they had produced a particular desired state with 0.2% fidelity. But instead they wanted to show that both of their devices had produced states their two devices had produced states that had 0.2% fidelity with each other. Yeah. Could you give me an idea of the number of, you know, the, the resources required to do that using your protocol and whether it would be easier than 10,000 years or two days on a supercomputer? So I think for, if you would like to estimate um, the full 53, uh, uh, like the full state uh, fidelity, that's not, something which really accessible so i can't even give you a number so typically what you have is that the, um, the number of measurements approximately scales is two to the n basically two to the so the exponent is one before the n or slightly below one um, okay. so yeah so that's kind of the order uh, which you would need to do so order of magnitude the, the resource expensiveness sort of scales 
roughly the same as the best classical simulation fidelity estimation. Yes. Uh, importantly, of course, what you could do, and that's what I was, you could just look at all possible subsystems up, up, up to a given size and, and, and at least learn something about this. Uh, in, in this sense about uh, how, how good they, they agree uh, um, up to a certain level of, of, of correlation depth, if you would, would like to find, formulate it in, 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 in say, correlations, you, you, you then know that they, they agree uh, up to a certain n-body correlations, which, which is the, the size of the subsystem you are willing to access or willing to spend. Thank you. All right, we have a question from Juan. Yeah. So I have, uh, so I see like all this exponential floating around in the estimators, right? Like, uh, but this is very generic. So meaning that this applies to any yeah. quantum state. So if you assume something about the quantum state, like for instance, yeah. that this is a matrix product state and so on. So can you do mm -hmm. better somehow or, uh, or not? Um, um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. And I think that's something we, we would like to we yeah, have also been asking ourselves and would like to work on uh, in the future. At the moment, the protocol is, is state agnostic, uh, and it it even it even tries to, to randomize um, the, the state itself. So, um, at the moment, we, we, it's it's not incorporated, but you can do better for for a certain state. But that's definitely something we would like to look at. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, let's thank Andreas again. All right, and we'll convene uh, around one for the next talk.